All right, so uh, we've been discussing uh, the introduction of cities um, when they transform uh, from mainly rural and hunter and gathering uh, environments to uh, we began to develop the agricultural revolution that would really lead to the explosion of population. So we're going to discuss this in chapter two. Um, and again, if you know to your syllabus, I am woefully behind in terms of where I should be in lecture, but don't worry about that. I'll get caught up very quickly. So make sure that, again that you stay on course with what is listed there and get caught, uh, get up to speed as uh, quickly as possible. So if you're not through uh, the first couple of chapters are relatively brief. So if you're not through those, uh, at least by Sunday, uh, you really want to start to hustle very swiftly. So we talked about again, uh, the requirements to even have a large urban environment. The basic fundamental thing that we talked about over these uh, first couple of weeks has been food. And once again, the basic thing you need to survive, food and water as you had alluded to previously, Stephen. Keep that second one in mind as we talk about, you know, um, uh, many non-Western cities in the 21st century because uh, one of the things that's uh, really impacted, uh, they've had, has had an impact on places in India, China, and Africa is uh, access to good, clean, uh, healthy water, which we can take for granted here, but, uh, you know, obviously that's a serious thing. So, again, as we talked about, people used to stay on the move. So, to be able to have a settlement, to settle down in one place, you need to make sure that you not only have enough food, Charles, but eventually you have to have a surplus. A surplus is more than what you need. And young men, this should be all of our goals in life. I shouldn't say that fully, but in American life, uh, to have more than what you need, food, money, access to education, access to health care. Again, at this time, it's just food and water. So once we know not only can we eat today, but we have more than we actually need, that's where you can really start to develop some things in society. So we say there are a surplus of food and other necessities. As your society became more developed, Stephen, and you have more people in it, there became other things that you needed. So now you may need like, okay, we got food and water. You know, now we might need some housing. Uh, now we might need some security. Uh, now we might need to educate people in ways to build houses and uh, farm effectively and uh, do um, and heal people. Um, we may need, um, okay, like, you know, this food is good, but, you know, a lot of times back in the day, Stephen, like, uh, it'll be food, but it wouldn't be tasting like, you know, all that great. So, man, how can we get some sugar? How can we get some salt? Um we got some like, you know, uh, we have a lot of good oranges and yams here, but uh, man, they got good pears over there. This village has good bananas, you know, so um, some villages, the villages that were able to have more of those things, they really develop very swiftly. The more things that you have uh, to offer your community, the more people that will flock there. But over time, Stephen, we also need to figure out how do we organize these surpluses? So we, get, we, we, we got more food than we need, but if we don't organize it carefully, that may not necessarily be the case for long. So we need to figure out a way to structure this so that we don't run out of stuff. Like, so politicians, Charles, like the whole, like, you know, to, like when we're talking about voting and stuff like that and participating in elections, it's all related to that. Like who gets what? Like that's what's getting decided from this period thousands of years ago to this very moment. So one of the things again is being voted now. Hey, should we give this money to HBCUs or should we not? Like that's an actual discussion. This is not an abstract. Again, if you're paying attention, should we give these people like, you know, again, people have been out of work. Should we give them $2,000 checks or should we not? Should we do things to protect our environment or should we not? Because again, like, you know, okay, it's, it's not just enough to worry about 2020. Well, we need to be thinking about if we want to keep these surpluses going, Stephen, we got to think about 2030, 2040, 2050. General Motors just announced the other day, Stephen, that they are uh, by, I want to say 2035, 
are aiming to like uh, not sell any cars that run on gasoline anymore. They're not going to even build any cars like that no more. It's a major, 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 major thing. So with this in mind, right, like all this, they're not just doing this out of generosity that if we don't do some things to like impact our environment, this great surplus and nobody's had a better, a greater surplus Charles, in the United States in the history of humanity. But if we don't manage that effectively, we're going to run out. So keep these things in mind. Like who gets it? Like, so organizing the surpluses and then who deciding what gets, who gets what? Of all these things that we have, we have this great bounty. We're going to decide who gets what. This led again, these surpluses led to some uh, distinct civilizations. In civilization, right, we talked about the concept of culture before. Most of you all have had me for um, another, for at least one uh, social science class. And uh, it is almost impossible to talk about social science without mentioning culture. Does anybody recall what we mean by culture? What do we mean by culture? Maybe you need to unmute yourself and then give yourself a two second delay before speaking. What do we mean by culture? Basically, like a certain uh, groups, I guess, lifestyle or how they um, live. Good. Excellent. Yeah, excellent. So norms, values of a given society. So good. Lifestyle in a simple way. Again, how do they live? What foods do they eat? What languages do they speak? Um, what's their family structure? Uh, what's their accepted form of marriage? What do they stress education, educating their people about? Do they educate their people to be really good fishermen? Do they educate their people to be able to master technology? And to be fair, even fishing itself can involve a certain levels of technology as initially anybody, uh, what do you, how do you think that the first humans began to fish? Spear. How did the first humans fish? A spear. Good. They might go stand up in the water, take a spear, and uh, that's probably not always the most fun, right? And it could be potentially dangerous. There might be some fish or other sea creatures that fight back. You trying to go over there and get your fish, Steven. There's some alligators trying to get some fish too. Alligator, like, oh shit. It's some way better over here than fish. Hey, dog, come on. He over here, man. Steven, he right here, dog. No, no, no. We, we got plenty of time. He's too slow. We're going to catch him. It's all good. So that could get very dangerous, right? So the technology involved, like, hey, look. Y'all saw what happened to Steven last week, right? Yeah, dog. That was, that was fucked up, man. All right, so look. We still need to be getting these fish. We got to figure out a way to get these fish, man, without standing in the water, dog. This is about the fourth cat, man, and it got off this year. We I ain't finna, I ain't finna be going up in there, dog. So we got to figure something out. But to have, like, you know, not make light of it, but to figure that out, you got to have time and space. First of all, you got to make sure that you're not going to starve while you're trying to figure this stuff out, Stephen. But you need time and space. Again, the luxury of American society to be able to take time out of your day to learn and you ain't got and you ain't gonna have to start. The places again that had the most uh, surplus were able to do those things. And now uh, Charles, you can figure out a way like, okay, look, maybe I can build something where I can be over here out of the water and I can still find a way to get the fish. Maybe we could find a way to trick them and they could think it's some food and they, they're trying to roam around a whole bunch of come around and then we could get a whole bunch of fish and we ain't even got to be doing all this stuff. It, like, you know, uh, we'll, we'll actually catch more fish and we'll get even greater surplus. And then we can have more time to do other stuff. We, we, as opposed to having to go out and fish every single day, maybe we can only fish like, you know, one or two days a week and that'll be enough for us to um, have like, you know, enough fish for the rest of the month. Again, the technology, whether we're talking about a fishing rod or um, having a computer on your cell phone. The, the basic purpose of this is to make life easier, make work easier, to get things done a lot more quickly. The technologies of it, whether we're talking about, you know, again, how to gather information or how to get from point A to um, B. Again, where people are walking, so okay, I'm gonna ride this stagecoach, so I'm gonna ride this car. And then maybe one day we'll get some stuff like they had on the Jetsons. 
So the places where you first had these things uh, of civilization, where not only do you have certain norms and values, Stephen, your norms and values defi uh, shortly define and shape the whole rest of the world. That the norms and values that you have adopted are so dope. And why do and why do people believe that your norms and values are so dope? Don't overthink it. Um, I guess because it's very unique and di and different from theirs. Nope. Hell no. Okay. Follow the conversation, y'all. Why do why do other people come to your city and think it's so dope? Very simple. Because they're not used to the culture. Nah. Pretty much same thing that Steven said. When they uh, go to the city, they have no choice but to like uh, it. Uh, yeah, I see the screen. No, sir. Good. Okay. You know, I love y'all to death. I hope y'all know that. But these conversations be troubling where it's like, it, it, it feels almost like it be words coming out of my mouth. And I be, I see y'all listening. I see y'all taking notes. But it's like the conversation is not registering at all. And if there are things that I need to slow down and repeat, let me know. But I think these things are pretty basic. So what is? So what do you think is unique about places like Mesopotamia, Egypt, uh, the Yellow River Basin in China, what, like these were the first uh, um, major cities. How did they become cities in the first place? I didn't hear you. So whenever you unmute yourself, give yourself a two to three second delay before you speak. Uh, like with Egypt, uh wasn't that like built by like, you know, like slaves or whatever, like building all the uh, buildings and stuff like that? Uh, every, a lot of different places have slaves. What is, again, what allows you to even become a city in the first place? Near a oh. water bank. Say it again? You said near a water bank last class. That definitely helps. I'm going to go back to this first slide one more time and, and, and hope that this helps. The food. All right, so these places, they have surpluses, man. Everybody else in the world is running around from place to place to try and get food. They're, they're, they're fishing by standing in lakes with spears. That's how they're getting their food. And when the food run out, they got to go to another place. Some places, the people didn't have to do that no more. They could stay in one place and chill and build stuff. And they got time to think and maneuver and they got time to think about like, hey, as opposed to just, just putting this spear in these fish, we could think of more efficient ways to do that. And that allows us to have way more food and way more of everything that we need. So when other people that's been running from place to place for millions of years getting their food, they come to Egypt, they come to Mesopotamia, and they're like, oh, shit, these motherfuckers got everything. Look at their technology. We over here still fishing with spears and stuff. And they're over here fishing, like with like high, like you know these rods and stuff, and they got ropes and like, oh my god, I've never seen anything like this before. So the reason why they were able to develop, they had a surplus. They had a surplus that other places did not have. No human beings have seen that before. Every, the state of human condition, and, and I thought, again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be cool because we've talked about this for two weeks. Like, when, I, when we're having these discussions, like, help me understand, honestly. Like, what's, what is, what's going on in y'all heads while we're having these conversations? Like, why is this not sticking? Like, what can I do better? No, nothing. I, I'm pretty much getting in and remembering stuff and the notes. It just be the general small questions that you ask that those I don't aren't really the small questions those are the whole major questions of the class if you don't understand that cities whether we're talking about back then or we're talking about new york today like it's more stuff in new york than there are in other places it's more resources there 
Now, like now, what we're going to get into later is what resources do we need? The, the resources that they needed in Egypt are very different than the resources that people need in Tokyo. But in both cases, people are coming to those places because they have more stuff, more opportunities for jobs, uh, more uh, cultural opportunities, more opportunities oftentimes in education. Like y'all, if y'all not following these basic concepts and you think that you're gonna get through this just by memorizing Egypt, uh, Mexico and Guatemala on a page, like that's not education. So the places where we first began to see these uh, surpluses really flourish was in these areas. And it definitely did help to shine that they were near bodies of water. That allowed again, you know, again, if you're near a body of water, where can you get there? A lot of fish. Water is essential to survival. So you, again, by if you can find a way to control and harness that water for your benefit, that allows you, again, you ain't got to move around as much. So yes, almost all of near these places were near bodies of water. But it's a lot of places on the planet that are near bodies of water that didn't have a surplus. And the main surplus that they had initially was what? Hunting and gathering. And uh, it was a uh, water, food, and shelter. Say it again, Stephen. Water, food, and shelter. Yes. So mainly, so the first one is food. Food, 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 food. If you do not have food as a human being, you're going to die. This is a very simple and basic concept. It's one that we can take for granted today because we live in the world's most advanced civilization. But most people don't live like that. Most people in the world today are wondering if they're going to be able to eat this week. I won't say most, many people on the planet today. We, we have reduced uh, starvation a great deal, but it's still a lot of people that are desperate and are in survival mode. It's really important that you understand that as Americans, man. It's people in this country that live like that. If you can't get food, ain't no, hey, can I go to college? Hey, can I go to the club? Hey, can I do this? Your whole life is limited. So the first thing that human beings needed to have to develop was uh, having food. A surplus means having more than you need. A surplus means having more than you need. A surplus means having more than you need. So in this way, right, we all have surpluses in food. Like, yeah, I'm not just, again, uh, eating for today, there are groceries in there where I can eat for weeks. Again, in 21st century, this is something that's, you know, taken for granted through most of human history. It wasn't like that. You could die, you could survive today. You could be putting these again, trying to be up here with these spears, with these fish all day. You might catch nothing. You might not catch no buffalo. You might not catch any elk. Please hear these conversations so I don't have to repeat them again. And when I ask y'all questions, you can actually answer them coherently as opposed to um, telling me that the most important uh, resource that people need is hunting and gathering. Hunting and gathering is what you use, is what people did to get the food. Now, as we advance past the hunting and gathering period, we go into the agricultural revolution. You have to write a paper, Charles, about the three major revolutions. It's the first one.
So I see y'all taking these notes. I see, I'm, I'm, I'm watching some of y'all take them. Notes only help you though, if you look at them again. And most importantly, they, like it has to make sense. Like it's like y'all are upperclassmen and y'all have had me before. So you should understand this by now. Education is not just a, a random memorization of facts. It's not learning and education. Anyone can do that. Too often in American, uh, the American school system, we have uh, taught you all in a way where it focuses too heavily on just memorizing things. This is why like, you know, and too often I'm asking questions and we ask questions in class and people just yell out the answers because they've heard them a lot. Like you've heard me say food. So like, okay, like, so what's, what's today food? What was the uh, main impetus of the industrial revolution food? I need y'all not just to be yelling out answers. I need you to be able to know and explain and understand what you're capable of doing. You've all shown me this before. You just have to make efforts to do it. And we desperately have to work on these attention spans. Where you're not just writing this stuff down, you're not just sitting in lecture, but it's actually like processing and not like totally going over your head since a lot of this stuff seems to be doing. Because a lot of this is really straightforward. There are things that we're going to explore shortly that's going to be a bit more complex. So again, we okay. ran through this before. It's right here in black and white for you. For most of human history, like, so first off, right, this is based on the most important aspect, uh, the, the things that human beings need, not want. We got a lot of wants. We only have a few needs. The main thing that human beings need is food and water. But water is easier to get. Three-fourths of the planet is water. Water don't run from you. Water ain't gonna try and attack you uh, usually. Rains a lot. But that food is a very, very precious resource that can be challenging to get. So for most of human history, human beings have nomadically, and when, and when you say nomadic, what does that mean? What do we mean by nomadic? Nomadic means that you stay on the go. So when you see hear that somebody's a nomad, that they, they don't live in one place. So they're they're moving around a lot. So that's what's human existence. Again, like so you might see have some people that would literally be born like in southern Africa and over like you know a period of time, you know. Uh, they all in Northern Africa. You got people in Europe, like again, human beings, like you know, came, you know, originated from one centralized place and got to all types of places in the world. You got people that go to Europe, you got people in North America, you got people in South America, you got people in Asia, this big old planet. That happened because people was, was looking, moving constantly. Hey, where's food? Where's food? Where's food? And they're again hunting, going off of like uh eating berries from trees, eating fruit from trees, roots and nuts. But a lot of times that food supply would quickly dry up. That again, you have hunted the buffalo here so effectively that you killed them off. Again, there are all types of endangered species. Most of them are endangered because of us. Many. The environment also plays a role. But there are some animals, again, that we hunted so effectively, you know, and we continue to hunt them so effectively to this day that they die off. So that means that we got to go to the next place. So we have to be nomadic. We have to stay constantly on the go. This is for 500,000 years. It was a very tough ex um, existence. So 98%, so of all the time that there have been human beings on planet Earth, 98% of that time, we were hunters and gatherers. And what were, we, what were we hunting and gathering? What were we hunting and gathering? Uh -huh. Food, so like buffaloes and, fi and fishing. Uh, more specific, uh, more general than that. Yeah. What were we hunting right. and gathering? All we were, okay. 
We were gonna like. Well, what were we hunting and gathering? One word. Oh, oh, like surpluses or resources like that. So people had to stay on, on on the go in search of fresh food, as it says here in the bullet point. Um, and usually the food is going to be where you have more favorable clients. Um, and then, you know, again, so if it's near water, if it's warm weather, there's probably going to be more food there. There's going to be more animal lives. You can have oranges, apples, etc. And that allows people to settle in one place more quickly. So what were some of the qualities of these early cities? Deshaun, you had a question. I was I was about to ask because I see at the bottom at the last slide, it says something about migrating the cities, well not migrating, but going to cities that you know got a lot of surpluses and stuff. So my question was like, why did people go up north so like to Chicago back in the day? Because I, I know a lot of people want to go up north and go to Chicago, but when you think about like water or like having good areas where you could like plant and stuff like down south, like why why did people go up north? Why what made them want to go up north? Because of the second revolution. Does anybody recall what that is? I don't, I don't think I was in the class for that one. Does anybody recall what the second revolution is? You shouldn't have to be just in this class to know this as sociology students, and quite frankly, really just as Americans. So we so we're talking about the agricultural revolution here, right? And what do we mean? Revolution. What do we mean by revolution? Change. Oh, change. Good. So the first is the agricultural revolution. It, it fundamentally changed the way human beings live because now people can settle in one place, um, and a large amount of people can settle in one place for the first time in human history. For five hundred thousand years, we've been on the run. Now we can slow down finally because of the agricultural revolution. But there was another revolution that's related to Deshaun's question. What was that? Uh, are you referring to the Industrial Re Revolution? Say it again. Are you referring to the Industrial Revolution? Yes. So with the Industrial Revolution, farming and stuff like that, Deshaun, became a lot less important. You had to go work in factories. You had to go work for somebody else. And that was best had in places like Cleveland and New York and Philadelphia and Chicago and Detroit and St. Louis. In addition to uh, the, uh, the terrorism that was going on in the South. We'll, we'll, and we'll talk about that in great detail later on, but again, so I have walked y'all already through the first 500,000 years of humankind. It moved very slowly. After the agricultural revolution, film. And why? Because there was enough food. That basic thing. So first cities began to have a lot of food. So how we, you know, we will, you know, we'll talk later about, you know, the Roman Empire, like Rome started from a city. And that city that had these surpluses began to conquer the whole rest of the world. Because, so again, and make sure, like, please, 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 like, look, y'all are capable of doing this. Like, one of the things, like, like you got to read a lot more, people. Y'all brains, like, you know, I love y'all to death, but, like, these neurons don't fire like they should be sometimes. It's the same way, like if I tried to go lift 200 pounds today, it's not going to be as effective because I haven't done it as often. I could work up to that, but I got to get into a habit of doing so. If I try and like, you know, do that now, like, you know, uh, it'll be a shock to the system. 
So get into the habit of processing information and critical thinking, and it becomes a lot easier because you're going to have to do a lot of that in this class. This is not just a class for just rote memorization. So first, the, there are many qualities of early cities. We ain't into Chicago, Detroit, none of that yet. You know, these are maybe 100,000 people, 20, 30,000 people sometimes. Again, before that, people say it in groups of about 20 or 30 people. Why? Uh, that was like based on like survival, you know, with more people, whatever, like you said, last more food or more miles you have to feed and shelter and et cetera. So that was like a hit to have more people with you. Excellent, Charles. This is what I'm talking about right here. So now that you got enough food, if you want to have 10 kids, Charles, you could do that. We're going to have enough food to feed them. And you can have larger permanent, we can stay in one place. Because also, not only were you not, um, you know, uh, you wouldn't have enough uh, uh, food to feed anybody, like hunting could be dangerous. Mm -hmm. So now this permanent settlement, again, you can say, settle down in one place. You have a surplus. But Deshaun, the problems with a surplus, and like we said, we have to quickly organize, figure out who, um, decide and organize who's going to get what. So with this surplus, now you first begin to have your social class. Because again, you got different labors. There, there were a uh, different uh, division of labor. There were two jobs in hunter and gathering societies. There was one or two jobs that you could have. What were those again? Uh, to uh, either you were going to be the hunter and uh, or you would be the person who like, prepares the food, I guess, in a sense. Uh, nope, you're close. There were two jobs in hunter and gathering. One was hunting, you're right. So this hunt, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, so um, like, like maybe the women like gather like fruits and everything, like vegetables and stuff like that, like that may have been growing or no? Good, so, they were, so the two jobs were hunting and gathering. Part of our problem, like, look, if a question is asked, make sure that you like listen carefully to the question. Like, I don't be trying to trick y'all most of the time. A lot of this stuff be very basic and easy. So yes, and in hunting and gathering societies, there are two jobs. You either hunt it or you gather. Now that we have more advanced surpluses, we can do more jobs. We can have more jobs than that. Again, as I told you before, we can have somebody, we can have an engineer that thinks about your, your only job is to think about how can we find ways to get food even more quickly? How can we like, you know, okay, now we can like really give like, since we're gonna stay in one place, like we need to have some kind of like shelter and, and the kind of shelters that we have before that really wasn't cutting it. Like it still be raining and getting raining here sometime. Uh, you know, wild boar be coming in in the middle of the night. So maybe we can find somebody to, like, you know, build us a more effective shelter. Maybe we can like, you know, um, we're near this water, but sometimes, you know, uh, the lakes, you know, um, you know, it, when it rains a lot, like, you know, the water kind of like, you know, overtakes the banks and that um, be messing with our food and stuff. So maybe we can have somebody that organizes all the men in the group to like just take three months and like, you know, carry a whole bunch of big heavy rocks and put them at the edge of the lake so that the water don't come over here and now uh, flood us. Now, now we have many different jobs, but are all those jobs value equally. No. So this is the for the first time in human history, Stephen, we're going to have social classes where, hey, my job is more important than your job. I should get more of the surplus. But hey, like if it wasn't for me, like everybody would get sick and die. So I should get more of the surplus. But I'm the one that protect, like, you know, when these ghouls be coming over here and trying to take, you know, they poor and they starving and the ghouls be coming over here and trying to take our stuff. I'm the one who be rallying cats together to beat them off. I should get more of the surplus. And who should make these decisions? Well, like, look, the, the women, they over there with the kids. So, like, they don't even get to decide who uh, gets to take part in the surplus. If you don't believe in this God, then I'm not sure you should get to take part in the surplus. So now we have all types of divisions for the very first time. 
Now you would think, and let me be clear, right? This is not true of all cultures. So Native uh, Native American cultures, uh, for example, are noted for being a bit more generous with their surpluses. But we definitely did, but they did not have equality. They definitely had like a leader who like would get more sometimes. And we began to have a lot of different job. Like we, um, as your society became more developed, you didn't know you like you couldn't only survive anymore, Charles, with just hunters and gatherers. You need a lot of different jobs. The more advanced your society became. Again, like we're talking about this in a period of like, you know, thousands of years ago, but all these things hold true in different ways to Sean as it relates to like, you know, uh, human beings across time. That to say, the reason y'all get educated now is because we got a division of labor in this country and it's all types of jobs that we need done to keep the society going. Some jobs gonna get paid more than others because our society views these jobs as more important. Some jobs we ain't even gonna need 10, 15 years from now. Like, so it's getting, it's important to understand these uh, type of things, you know, not just in terms of like an academic context, but just again, putting your, your critical thinking hat, how this relates to, uh, to, to uh, today. Deshaun's question was a sound one in terms of like, okay, well, why people come to cities today? Like, you know, they're cold. Um, it'd be like, you know, um, not as lo a lot of uh, natural beauty. Although again, even there, like Chicago sits on a body of water. New York sits on a body of water. Los Angeles, like, you know, sits near the ocean. Miami sits near a large body of water. New Orleans sits near a, a, a large body of water. Seattle sits near a large body of water. So a lot of these things still hold true, but over time, they built things that were not just related to, like, you know, uh, relying on the water supply per se, or ship, uh, or goods being shipped into their uh, ports. So they had taxation and, and capital accumulation based upon this surplus. So again, this is where they first begin to have people pay tax, like, look, because people will see this surplus, right? Again, you've been a nomadic group, uh, Stephen, for thousands of years. You've been on the move, had to go from place to place. Now you come to Egypt and you want to stay there. Well, how do you think the people that's been living there and building it might feel about that? Anybody? They probably wouldn't like it since, since you just came in and you think that you can just come in and, not, and, and, and put yourself in like a, a certain group. Very good, Stephen. Right, like, look, yeah, you just finna come over here. You think you and you finna take advantage of all our surplus. You ain't finna contribute nothing, man. Shit. So, Stephen, you can stay, especially if you have some service that you know um, that you know we can use. Like, uh, Stephen, maybe you were really good putting together things, building things with your hands. We could use people like that in our village. But for you to stay, Stephen, you are gonna have to pay some taxes, dog. So we finna. So for everybody, to take, so for everybody to take advantage of this surplus. We're going to tax y'all this much. And we're going to use that money in taxes to get other things that benefit the village. Some of these things included public buildings and stuff, Charles. These are the things that, again, because after a while, okay, we got enough food, we got enough water, we got good shelter, we got pretty good weapons. So now it became like, okay, look, we're not just going to look to get like any kind of basic shelter, Charles. We're going to try and really build some real fly stuff here. So this is where like, you know, hey, you know what? Let's just build these pyramids, dog, just because. Fuck it. We got the time. We got enough food. We got all these people over here that's willing to work, Charles. And if they ain't willing, we'll make them willing. Because this is also where you really begin to have warfare for the very first time at levels that, you know, are really the um, same. Because once we have enough resources, Charles, and yes, maybe sir. this village over here, they got a certain amount of resources. People begin to think like, man, you know what? You know what? We got a lot. But you know what's better than a lot? More. So we finna go over there and take their stuff, too. So again, very quickly amongst this, you develop the ruling class. In every early city and civilization, uh, Deshaun, you had a class of people that had more power, influence, and money than everybody else. We'll talk about this in great detail later. Other features of cities. 
This is where they be first began to have a written. Why do you think a written language was so important in these uh, uh, for these people? Why was a written? Why would a written language be important? Well, written language uh, because since people were like you know all over uh, different uh, continents and countries and they were traveling, they needed one language where they can all communicate. Because, you know, if they never made one written language that they could communicate, they would never be able to discuss or trade or, you know, figure out what everybody would need to do in the community. Excellent, Charles. Here we go. That's some critical thinking there, young man. Exactly. And then, too, if you have really good ideas about how we should farm, about how we should, like, you know, build a house, what if something happens to Charles? What if, you know, Charles has a, like, you know, a terrible fishing accident? Did all these ideas go away with Charles? No. We're going to write these ideas down so we can look at the ideas of, uh, 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 of uh, you know, a Kant, a, um, a uh, Aristotle, a uh, Pythagorean, uh, many great philosophers that kind of informed the thinking of the modern world. We could get their ideas down on paper and we can share and disseminate those and improve upon their ideas. These, these architectural ideas that Stephen had about how to build like houses really effectively and make it where they don't like, you know, uh, get rain, they're more protected from the sun. We can carry that on for generation to generation. We don't have to just, again, hold that idea like for himself. Now, again, this is where we also have patents and stuff like that, Charles, where I'm like, okay, look, yeah, I can have, and that's, we get much later late um, into that. Y'all can have my idea, but y'all need to pay for it, dog. So we'll come to those kind of things later on. But all this is from a written language so that we can communicate uh, amongst different groups and we can make sure that uh, these ideas that helped us to build our society and our city so effectively, we can share those ideas with the next generation. And then you also had, this is where you first began to have art, Stephen. Again, most people were spent trying to find food. So like drawing stuff and, hey, I'm going to write this poem. I'm going to write this rap just because I want to express myself. That was a very new concept. A couple more things before we go for the day. Is this becoming clear to y'all, though? Are y'all seeing the historical evolution? Yes, sir. Again, we are walking through history here. Like I said before, 500,000 years, Stephen, the walk is really slow. All of a sudden, we get food, we and we get a surplus of food. Like, oh my god! Now human beings can do all types of stuff. This led to the first revolution. I said, like you know, so again, like uh, I said, uh, the industrial revolution, and it was the second major human revolution. In your papers, though, you got to write about three revolutions, Stephen: the agricultural, the urban, and the industrial. The urban and industrial are tied to the urban. The, uh, I'm sorry, the agricultural and the industrial are tied to the urban. The agricultural and the industrial are tied to the urban. Because you can only have an urban revolution, Stephen, if you have the surplus that comes from the agricultural revolution. You can only have an urban revolution if you have the food surplus that comes from the agricultural revolution. You can only have the urban revolution if you have the food surplus that comes from the agricultural revolution. The agricultural revolution made it again, not only where you had this surplus, but you didn't have to keep moving around to get your food. As a result, more and more people wanted to come to your city, Charles. This spreads a huge level of population. Your population increases. But you gotta find a way to get this stuff organized. All these people coming very quickly, if you don't find a way to get organized, uh, Charles, again, not only are people coming, I told you, Stephen, before, not because we got enough food and stuff. Charles want to have like 10, 11 kids and stuff, dog. So, and some of his neighbors, his neighbors like, you know what? I'm going to have eight kids too. I'm going to have like seven kids. Now, yeah, we got a whole bunch. Stephen, you the mayor, you looking at this like that. You know what? We got to find some way to have some organization. We got to organize this stuff are we gonna run out of food and everything else because Charles keep wanting to popping up babies? So we gotta find some way to organize this so we don't run out of stuff. Your food production is definitely gonna be dependent on Deshaun upon your environment. 
So again, it's like, you know, um, it's not an accident that um, in America, a lot of the first major cities actually emerged in the South because that's where the best primary was. Over time, the technology played a huge role because, but technology only comes about, Charles, after you get that surplus. Technology, and don't think of technology as only computers. Uh, the ink pen was one of the most important forms of technology known to man. Again, I talk about the written language, Charles. How do you like you? How do you spread the written language through this form of technology right here? Again, we take it for granted, but over time. So now, again, the same thing. I ain't got to use this. I can use a computer uh, to communicate all my ideas. One day, so hell, like I was gonna say one day soon, but we ain't gotta say one day soon. I can use my voice to put these ideas on paper if I wanted to. Y'all understand? Y'all see how the technology is advancing? So yes, technology, sir. but again, all of that can only happen in in places where people got more than enough. Keep this in mind. Um, I'll leave it there for now. Again, Monday, make sure again, their lecture is going to be recorded and posted for you. I know Charles reached out about uh, wanting to meet about the paper. I suggest that many of you all follow his uh, follow suit on that sometime soon. Question comments uh, before we leave for the day. Uh, yeah. Uh, sp yeah. Speaking about the uh, paper, I was going to ask, uh, can I meet with you today about setting up an appointment about the paper? I won't be able to meet with you today, but I'll uh, I'll send a Zoom link for some time on Monday for you. Okay, thank you. But make sure again you have at least the first couple of chapters read. How uh, the library on uh, that were they able to get that book to you all? They have the book. We just can't, you know, take it out the library. Oh, so I got more information on that. I uh, got a flash drive today. So I'm going, uh, after I get back from helping one of my friends today, I'm going to go ahead and try to have, she's going to help me scan it to my jump drive. And Barry, I'll be able to try to send that to you and Deshaun with her so we can get that situated today. What time? Because uh, I'm going to be on campus today. Oh, okay. Uh, I want to say I'll be back around 1.30. I'm going to be back around 1.30 because Dr. Muhammad's the only class I have today. So, you know, I'll be here all day. So whenever time you come, uh, once we finish scanning, I could just put it on your thumb drive or I can just share it with Google Docs and we can share it. And if y'all have any trouble with that, let me know ASAP. Get started again. If uh, it, you got a lot from today's lecture that helped with the paper. Um, so if you need to go back and look at it, uh, but make sure that you're keeping up with the reading. If you have any troubles, let me know ASAP. And I'll be scheduling meetings with uh, you all, uh, with uh, Stephen and Charles sometime uh, from Monday or Tuesday at a time that's convenient for you all. Have a wonderful weekend. Yes, sir. Thank you.